Good afternoon, everyone. If you could please take your seats. Our program's about to begin. And just before we get started, I, um, I just wanted to, to note we've, we've got some chairs here open, but of course we've got standing room out there. And then we're also live streaming on our website at worldbank.org backslash EDS01. And so I want to thank and welcome all those who are watching virtually. Um, my name is Felice Gorordo, and I am the acting U.S. Executive Director of the World Bank, and it is a real honor to be able to host you here today at the World Bank Global Hall to commemorate and celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month. May is a month in which we honor Jewish Americans and celebrate the contributions, culture, and values that they have passed down from generation to generation and that have shaped who we are as Americans. And as the White House Proclamation states, it's also a time in which we remember that the power lies within each of us to rise together against hate, to see each other as human beings, and to ensure that the Jewish community is afforded the safety, security, and dignity they deserve as they continue to shine their light on America and around the world. To this end, we are truly fortunate and honored to have two distinguished guest speakers with us today. And to kick things off, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, who serves as the U.S. Special Envoy to monitor the and combat anti-Semitism and leads efforts to advance U.S. foreign policy to counter anti-Semitism throughout the world. Prior to her time as Special Envoy, Ambassador Lipstadt had a storied career as a historian, academic, and author. At Emory's University's TAM Institute for Jewish Studies, which she helped to found, and was also the Dorat Professor of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Study. Uh, she has also taught at the University of Washington, UCLA, Occidental College, and, other, and many other institutions. Her numerous award-winning books include The Eichmann Trial, Denial, Holocaust History on Trial, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, and Beyond Belief, The American Press, and The Coming of the Holocaust. She received the National Jewish Book Award three times, and most recently in 2009 for anti-Semitism here and now. And Ambassador Lipstadt is probably best known for having been sued for libel by David Irving, one of the world's leading Holocaust deniers. And that trial was depicted in the 2006 film Denial, which was based on her book, History on Trial, My Day in Court with a Holocaust Denier. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Lipstadt to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. I know this is, I'm told, a historic occasion. This is the first time this topic has been uh, discussed within the confines of the World Bank, or at least formally uh, presented on. I want to apologize that I'm not going to be able to stay as long as I hoped. I've been asked to brief a couple of people, some of whom you know, uh, on the current state of affairs, so uh, I'm going to have to leave for that. But that uh, doesn't mean I can't come back, because I work in a little place a few blocks from here. So um, anti-Semitism has been on the rise over the past two decades. Any organization study has shown it's been rising in countries worldwide. But since October 7th, we've seen literally a tsunami of anti-Semitism uh, spread across the world. Uh, I've just returned from a pretty grueling trip to uh, Austria and Hungary. They're not any different. Uh, but I've been in so many different countries and, of course, in this country. And it's not uncommon to hear anymore about people 
including on American college campuses, taking the mezuzot off their door, the little uh, scrolls on the outside of their door, and putting them inside, of deciding not to wear a Jewish star, of uh, if they're at a campus and they're going to a Friday night Shabbat dinner, just saying, I'm busy tonight, and not announcing where they're going. In other words, in too many places, Jews, including in this country, but not only in this country, we see Jews going underground. Now, something else has happened since October 7th. Many Jews have suddenly realized that those who they thought were their allies and their friends and with whom they had common ground were not, and they have been drawn to their Jewish identity. But what I'd like to do today is lay out for you a, a possibly a different, structurally a different way of looking or a more expanded way of looking at anti-Semitism. And we have, at the State Department feel this is a really more uh, uh, accurate way of looking at the situation today. And we call it our multi, I, I, for the moment, a multi-leveled or multi-layered approach. Anti-Semitism, first and foremost, is certainly a threat and often a lethal threat to Jews and Jewish institutions. In about six weeks' time or two months' time, I'll be going to Argentina to, come, to be there to participate in the 30th anniversary of the bombing of the AMIA, the Jewish Community Center, something done by, uh, as the uh, Iranian courts have now determined, many of us didn't need, knew that long before, but uh, done by uh, Hezbollah with the uh, support of Iran. Um, but until October 7th, that was the biggest assault on a Jewish institution um, uh, since the Holocaust. Um, but and, so it's a lethal, it can, and in this country, of course, Pittsburgh, Poway, we've seen numbers of lethal threats to Jews. And that alone would make it something valid for governments to address for governments to be worried about. Governments essentially work, and I, I mean this loosely in loco parentis, their job is to make sure their citizens are safe, whether it's taking care of the elderly, particularly the vulnerable citizens, um, and whether they're taking care of the elderly, work conditions, health conditions, et cetera. Um, and so when you have a minority that is under assault, it is a government's responsibility to protect them. But anti-Semitism is more than solely that. Um, and that has become so clear in the past seven months. It is also a threat to democracy, to the rule of law, to public institutions. Because anybody who has adopted, who has bought into the, anti, uh, the conspiracy myth, and I do not say conspiracy theory, I say conspiracy myth, which is the cornerstone of anti-Semitism, believes the Jews control the, you can fill in banks, media, government, et cetera. In other words, they've given up on the sense of a fair, uh, democratic uh, uh, rule of law society. And the flip side of that, and we've seen that on many college and university campuses, not just in this country, but certainly in this country, those who are the objects of the animus doubt whether the authorities can or will, two different verbs make it very different, but can or will protect them. You heard students on campuses saying, you know, the, the police just stood there as we were being uh, assaulted. So that's the second level. And the third level um, is as a threat to uh, national or international security and stability. What has become very clear to us is that malign actors, malign influencers, be they other countries, be they uh, NGOs, be they individuals who are active on social media, whatever it might be, uh, use anti-Semitism as a way of ginning up uh, hatred, of ginning up uh, hostility towards Jews. Sometimes they do it out of an ideological commitment, because that regime, that NGO, that individual is truly anti-Semitic. And sometimes they do it out of a utilitarian objective. It serves their international purposes. Now, one caveat here as I, I look at this influence of uh, malign actors, they can't create a fire where there are no embers where there isn't a fire already burning. Because sometimes by, play, by citing malign uh, influencers, especially foreign malign influencers, foreign actors, it sounds like you're saying, oh, it's all an outside kind of uh, force. 
But if they find, in other words, as Hannah Arendt, the uh, uh, famous uh, political philosopher, used to say, they could never uh, create this against the bicycle riders. Now, today, with bicycle lanes, there's some people who hate bicycle riders, but that's for another conversation. Um, but, uh, but if there's already that residue or that existence of anti-Semitism, and we're talking about what can legitimately be called by, and is called by historians, the longest, oldest, continuous hatred. There is no sentiment that has acted, lasted so long in such a continuous fa fashion and has morphed into different forms, and about that in a minute. But it, it is used, therefore, by these malign actors to create a sense of um, feeling in a country that maybe we are a failed state to, to, uh, 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 to create divisions in social cohesion to, and to create fear in people. Is our government able to protect us so, and take care of us and to fight this, this bad influence? Uh, particularly, but not only in democracies. It's a very, way of, a very strong way and very apt way of creating fear within a democracy that uh, we are a failing state. Um, so I think it's really important as we talk about anti-Semitism, we're not just talking about protecting a particular group, which I would say that is a legitimate thing, but we're talking about something much bigger and much wider. Now, a moment ago, I referred to it as a, uh, a virus, and we've all become familiar uh, with, more familiar with viruses certainly in the past couple of years. But when I say that, I talk about it as its ability to adapt. Uh, for, you know, if you look um, over, over, over millennia, um, the Jew has often been used as the, I don't want to say boogeyman because that makes it sound like I'm making light of it, but as the point counterpoint to what a society, a religion, a culture wants to be. For early Christianity, it was the Jew as the um, uh, killer of Jesus. Of course, the fact that Jesus was a Jew and, and, and everyone involved in the story, except the Romans who actually kill him, were, were uh, Jews doesn't matter. But that was how the Jew was depicted. Um, uh, early Islam aspects of it, though often uh, 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 Jews lived in Muslim majority countries in much better conditions than in Christian majority countries, but that too was part of it. Protestantism, that too was part of it. Jumping ahead, socialism, uh, eugenics, Nazism. The Jew becomes the thing you, that is the lowest form in the society. The Jew becomes the enemy against whom you wish to um, organize. Doesn't mean that it's in every society, but it is persistent. And it's adaptable, because if you think about uh, uh, communism, certainly during the, the period of the uh, Soviet Union, um, and the use, their use of anti-Semitism, and then you think about Nazism earlier on, and their use of anti-Semitism, these are systems which saw the world very differently, and yet the Jew becomes the object of the hatred. In fact, one of the things that I have begun to do, I used to talk about um, anti-Semitism on a political spectrum, from the right to the left, extreme right to extreme right. I no longer do that because I think it's more uh, efficacious to talk about it as a horseshoe where the two extremes meet one another. So in some essence, you're talking about a policy of extremism and the two extremes share the same stereotypical template about the Jew, something to do with money, something to do with power, but power used uh, uh, punching above their weight, being able to do things that others can't do, um, control, uh, maybe smart, but smart in, used in a malign or insidious fashion. That every stereo, every prejudice, whether you're talking about a racial prejudice, whether you're talking about a gender-based prejudice, uh, 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 religious prejudice, has its stereotypes and it has its template of stereotypes. And that's the template of stereotype uh, for anti-Semitism. So a moment ago, I, I referred to anti-Semitism as a prejudice, and it really operates as do other prejudices. Um, in the sense that the, the, the person who was the anti-Semite, like the person who was the racist, 
the misogynist, the homophobe, whatever it might be, uh, looks upon at the objects of their hatred as lesser than. Keep them, certainly in this country with racism, it's, it's you know, keep, I, I've lived the last 30 years in Atlanta. The, the black person uh, should know their place. Of course, that has, that has changed dramatically, certainly in Atlanta, a city we often describe as uh, surrounded on four sides by Georgia. Um, but, uh, or the further north you go out of Atlanta, the more in the deep south you are. I don't know if I'm allowed to make those political, but I make them anyway, what the hell. Uh, let them fire me. Um, but um, but uh, as long as the black man or the woman knew their place, it was okay. Their place was not on the sidewalk, if a white person was walking there. Their place was certainly not in their ch the white person's children's school and it was certainly not in the White House. But as long as you kept them down, you punched down, because they're lesser than. That is true for anti-Semitism as well. The Jew is dirty, the Jew spreads COVID. We see that particularly in um, ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods with the attacks on Jews, but even in, in uh, uh, other forms, you know, other places as well. But there was the added element, and it goes back to the stereo, the template of stereotypes that I was talking about, that is unique to anti-Semitism, punching up. The Jew is more powerful. The Jew is wealthier. The Jew is smarter in that malicious way. The Jew knows how to punch above their weight. And they are a threat to me. So they must be stopped by any means necessary. So that really is the uh, construct. It's a complicated, uh, complex, uh, variegated construct of anti-Semitism. Um, I would argue that too often, in too many institutions, good institutions, uh, respected and respectable institutions, uh, there's been a failure to take anti-Semitism seriously because often Jews don't fit into what is perceived or don't seem to fit into what is perceived as the stereotype of what a object of prejudice is. You know, people would say, oh, what are they complaining about? They're whites, they're rich, they're powerful. Remember the template? They control, um, and of course, not all Jews are white. In Israel alone, over 50% of the population is from non-Ashkenazi backgrounds, from either Muslim-majority countries, Africa, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in this country, the, the uh, estimate is 12%. Um, and of course, not all are wealthy, but that doesn't matter. That's the perception. So we're talking about something that has uh, insidious qualities and has risen uh, dramatically since, uh, since October 7th. What can we do about it? And it's, we can't solve, it's, it's not, one hopes it's solvable, um, uh, but at least let's hope it's controllable. And I think amongst the things that must be done um, is that people, leaders, whether they be leaders of institutions, leaders of uh, organizations, leaders of multilateral multi, uh, organizations, um, or institutions like the World Bank, speak out. Speak out expeditiously and speak out unequivocally. There is no but when it comes to hatred of any kind, including anti-Semitism. There's a, uh, often a willingness to speak about, out about other prejudices as they should be spoken out about, and as they should be condemned, and as they should be fought. But when it comes to this, there's yes, but. There's, a, there's, a willing, there's an acceptance now, or a recognition now, that if the victim of, uh, of, of prejudice or of uh, discrimination uh, says, I have, been, I, I have been discriminated against, I feel that's a prejudicial remark, we believe them. Remember, me too, believe the women. And yet, when it comes to the Jew, that often is not the case. Not always, but it's too often not the case. So you get a failure, failure to speak out, a failure to take it seriously, and a willingness to challenge that you don't have in other cases. So first and foremost, I would say that leaders, whether they be, again, national leaders, municipal leaders, uh, uh, leaders of institutions, educational institutions, other kinds of institutions, 
uh, speak out. The second thing that I think is so important is to avoid the politicization of anti-Semitism. Goes back to the horseshoe. Sometimes you get into this um, strange uh, debate, which is worse, on the right or on the left. When I was testifying before Congress, before for my confirmation hearings, I made it very clear that I'm an equal opportunity anti-Semitism fighter. It doesn't care. It doesn't bother me where it comes from. And to get into that conversation is it leads you nowhere. And in fact, I have uh, friends who are on the uh, left who see anti-Semitism on the right, and they see it very accurately. They don't exaggerate. They see it precisely as it is. And I have friends on the uh, right who see it on the left, and they too are accurate. The problem is they don't often see it standing next to them because it's too disconcerting to say someone with whom I share so many other political views engages in this insidious hatred. Um, there must be a willingness, again, of uh, states, of cities, of countries, of universities to enforce the laws that exist to protect uh, the minorities and to protect um, what's go what exists in their, in their society. And above all, to educate. Now, education is not a magic bullet. Uh, I'm reminded of the fact that in Germany, you know, there were, there were death camps where people were killed by gas, but there were also mobile killing units, Einsatzgruppen. Um, there were four major units. They worked with allies from many of the uh, uh, countries in which they uh, were, were operating. Uh, but of the four units, three of the leaders had PhDs. One had two PhDs in law and in economics. I'm, and one was a minister, ordained minister. So you can be a PhD and an SOB at the same time. Um, and you can, you can be a, a well-educated person and have a very malleable uh, backbone. Um, but I think it is crucial. It is crucial that we speak out. And, the, and with this, I want to close and go back to my initial point. Uh, you can speak out because you think any form of prejudice of which this is one is wrong. You can speak out because you have Jewish friends, you are Jewish, you have Jewish relatives, Jewish neighbors, and you, you see what's happening and you think it's wrong. But if neither of those things apply to you, but if you care about international security, if you care about international uh, and national stability, if you care about democracy, if you care about the rule of law, if you care about public institutions, um, then you have to speak out about this. Um, and in closing, noting that this is Jewish American Heritage Month, uh, I'm, I'm sort of saddened that uh, the topic to be discussed is what is done to Jews and not what Jews do. You know, and too often we talk about uh, uh, how Jews died, but not how, how they were killed, but not how they live. Um, and I think and speaking in this country uh, where there has been such a renaissance of Jewish life uh, and such a flourishing of Jewish life, um, let's hope that the next time you gather and the next time you have a, uh, a, a celebration of Jewish American Heritage Month or just a celebration of uh, Jewish culture, it will be on the affirmative and not on the negative. Because if we only look at the affirmative, I, I, re I once was speaking to a, uh, a, a law professor who uh, had a very stellar career. And he told me that he had been married twice. And he was then on his second marriage. And he, if he said, in my first marriage, I was so busy um, building my career and establishing myself that I, didn't, I neglected my family. And I expected, especially neglected educating my children about their Jewish heritage. He said, in my second marriage, I've done much better on that regard. He said, but in my, my, my children, my first marriage, they, they don't know much about being Jewish, but if ever Jews are attacked, they, I know they will be at the barricades. And, part of, and he was very proud of that, and I, I smiled. I didn't say anything, but inside, a little part of my heart was breaking because they had ceded to the oppressor power over their identity. Uh, Jewish heritage in this country worldwide is multifaceted, is, is rich, 
is, has given so much to the world, has been such an important part of the world, uh, that today we look at, uh, at one of the threats, but I hope in the future we'll live in a society in a time we can afford to set that aside and look and celebrate the positive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you for your great leadership, for your service, and for what I would describe as a master class in the last 10 minutes. Another round of applause. And, and when we get you back here, I want to have a sit down and talk about how it is to be on a feature film, see your life portrayed in a feature film. You were expecting Rachel Weiss to work. That <laughs> Next time we'll have both. Thank you so much. I also want to take this moment quickly to recognize uh, senior management here, our managing director of operations, Anna Bierde, and many members of senior management and members of the board from literally around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next speaker is a distinguished leader in this space, and also it's a personal treat uh, because he's a, a dear friend and a former colleague of mine from my time in the Obama White House. Jonathan Greenblatt is CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, the world's leading anti-hate organization with a distinguished record of fighting anti-Semitism and advocating for just and fair treatment for all. Jonathan joined ADL in 2015 after serving in the White House as Special Assistant to President Obama and Director of the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. Prior to government service, Jonathan had distinguished career in business as a successful entrepreneur. He co-founded Ethos Brands, the company that launched Ethos Waters, acquired by Starbucks. How many of you have been to Starbucks and bought uh, Ethos Water? That was Jonathan. Um, and he founded All for Good, acquired by Points of Light in 2011. Uh, since becoming CEO of, CEO of ADL, Jonathan has modernized ADL while refocusing it on the mission it's had since its founding in 1913, to fight the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. Jonathan's first book, It Could Happen Here, Why America is, the, is Tipping from Hate to the Unthinkable and How We Can Stop It, is a primer on how we as individuals as organizations and as a society can combat anti-Semitism and hate. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Greenblatt to the stage. So Jonathan, um, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm, I think we're just gonna jump right in here if it, if it sounds good to you. Um, right at the top, if I may, what does it mean to you to be Jewish American? And why is it important to celebrate and commemorate Jewish American Heritage Month? Well, I'll just start by first of all saying it's a privilege to be here at the bank. I'm really grateful, Felice, for inviting me and to Anna uh, for facilitating this. I also wanna recognize what a, an honor it is to follow Ambassador Lipstadt whose scholarship and her public service is really renowned and deservedly so. Um, look, it's interesting. I mean, I'm a Jewish person, always have been. Uh, but Jew, being Jewish was never part of my sort of professional life until I took this job at ADL. I mean, I was born to a family, like a middle class family in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor from Germany who, by the way, was very German, who didn't dream when he was a young man of having grandchildren in America. He dreamt of having grandchildren in Germany. My great-grandfather fought in the First World War for Germany. Um, so I don't think when he was a young person he ever would have imagined that one day he would be here. And I'm the husband of an Iranian uh, Jewish woman who came to the United States as a political refugee in 1989 who never imagined that one day her children would be born here in America, my kids. I mean, they 
imagined when she was a little girl, she imagined her children would be born in Iran because where else would they be? So one thing about being a Jew is knowing that all of this can go away like that. I can't imagine my grandchildren being born anywhere other than here. But our own experience tells us in the last 50, 70, 100 years that there can be something temporal to all this. So being Jewish is living with a kind of awareness that history is not something in the past. It's part of our lives every day. And on the other hand, being Jewish is the most defining aspect of who I am. Being Jewish is keeping a kosher home. Being Jewish is having Shabbat every Friday night of my adult life. Being Jewish is going to services on a Saturday morning. Being Jewish is laughing probably a little bit harder at Larry David than some other people, right? Really. Um, so for me, it is the way that I see the world. And I feel so blessed to be here in these United States of America, which has been, I would argue, the greatest, really the greatest uh, country for the Jewish people in our history of diaspora. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go a little bit off script here because I think, you know, the, the ambassador talked about celebrating the accomplishments of the Jewish people. And you've had some amazing accomplishments. Um, talk to us about co-founding such an iconic brand like Ethos, exiting it to Starbucks, and how that prepared you for this role. Well, true story, that prepared me for today at the bank. Because the last time I was here, <laughs> I met with a purchasing manager to see if I couldn't get Ethos Water sold. That is amazing. Sold. That it is incredible. Literally, trying to get Ethos Water sold here. Did you get it sold no, here? No, there was a contract with Cisco or someone, <laughs> and I couldn't get it in the building. They had Aquafina or something like that. Aquafina or Dasani, I don't remember. Um, but uh, look, I mean, the thing that's always motivated me is not to work in nonprofit or business, or I've served in government, like I said, for the two we serve together, is to change the world. That's one of the things I appreciate about all of you. All of you are here because of commitment to public service. All of you are here because of a desire to make the world a better place. I totally share that. Um, I served, I did international economics at the White House uh, at an earlier part of my career, and I actually worked for a former World Bank executive named Chuck Meisner. Uh, who ended up dying in a plane crash with Secretary Brown in 1996. But I spent a lot of time overseas in uh, emerging markets in Asia and Latin America, and I saw people living, you know, the billions of people who live on, you know, a dollar a day, or the four billionaires who live on four dollars a day. And I saw firsthand how the world water crisis is probably the single largest driver of child, um, you know, morbidity and the leading cause of death for kids under the age of five and has very difficult uh, productivity and economic implications for much of the world. And so then after business school, my roommate uh, had been at McKinsey and he had worked for the beverage industry before going to business school. And he's the one who originally had the idea. And I was running a division of a software company and having spent time developing world and knowing how to drive sales and how to build a brand it felt like something that we could do together. And I'm proud of the fact that every bottle of Ethos Water sold donates at least a nickel to help children around the world get clean water. And so it has donated scores upon scores of millions of dollars to fund clean water and sanitation access in communities in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central and uh, South America. Amazing. You know, they say that once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur. Did you bring the entrepreneurial mindset to the ADL? Uh, well, my SVP for International Affairs, Marina Rosenberg, is here at the front row. She would say yes and please stop. <laughs> no, uh, probably. Like, I think you're right. I learned uh, from Ethos to Starbucks, then my other venture, All for Good, we incubated inside Google. And I saw how those big companies, big brands operated. And I know what it's like to start with an idea and a PowerPoint slide and to turn it into, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. So I've tried to bring that spirit, that drive, that creativity, that ingenuity to ADL. And I think it's helped us. I mean, there's a lot of nonprofits out there, but I'm proud of the fact that in eight years, we've tripled our revenue, we've expanded our reach, but we've also done that because we need to in this environment because of the intensification and the expansion of anti-Semitism and hate. 
Yeah, and actually it, using that opportunity to kind of pivot the conversation, um, this is a moment to celebrate the rich heritage of, of the Jewish American people, but we also believe it's an opportunity to shine a light on what President Biden has called a ferocious surge of anti-Semitism in America and around the world. And we heard from uh, the ambassador, and it's pretty well known that anti-Semitism has been described as the world's oldest hate. Yeah. Um, in your words, what is anti-Semitism? And um, how can we understand it in the context of 2024? So it's a good question, a complicated one, Felice, but I'll try to answer it quickly. Anti-Semitism is an irrational hatred of the Jewish people as individuals or as institutions. It is a kind of conspiracy, as Ambassador Lipstadt said, that typically centers all evil on the Jew or the Jews. And look for a thousand years, anti-Semitism, this hatred of the Jews, was grounded in a religious-based hatred because the early church and then uh, the crown, and by the way, the early uh, proponents of Islam, they hated the Jews for not accepting Jesus and not accepting Muhammad, and it led to institutionalized, systematic discrimination, marginalization, and persecution all over Europe and in parts of the Middle East, and, and slaughter, just so we're clear. Um, and then with the advent of the Age of Reason, uh, the religion, and the realization that maybe you know, the, the, the sun doesn't orbit around the earth, that maybe we are part of a bigger universe and sort of, again, the advent of science as we know it. The view is, well, maybe the Jews aren't a problem because of their religion, they're a problem because of their race. And this racialized anti-Semitism really flourished in Europe and this notion that, as Hitler put it, the Jews are definitely a race, just not a human one. And the science of eugenics, or the pseudoscience, posited that Jews were a subhuman people. And then, of course, that culminated in the Shoah, the Holocaust, and eugenics was exposed as a fraud. And so then it moved to, well, the Jews aren't a problem because of their religion. The Jews aren't a problem because of their race. Now it became, in the latter half of the 20th century to today, the Jews are a problem because of their state. And today, anti-Zionism is frequently an expression of anti-Semitism. Now, to be clear, you can have very strong feelings about Bibi Netanyahu. You can have very strong, as I do, you can have very strong feelings about Israeli policies, as I do. But as someone who believes, as organization believes in a two-state solution, that thinks you will only have peace in the Middle East when you have security and safety for Israelis, and dignity and equality for Palestinians in some configuration where they can live side by side in two states of their own. What I recognize is that very often Israel and Zionist is used as a euphemism for the Jew, the historic eternal epithet. And that's why anti-Semitism today is so problematic because it may appear political, but it's not. And encampments at universities may claim to be peaceful, but let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. An encampment where people are standing around holding signs that say, kill the Zionists, that's not nonviolent, folks. You are not nonviolent if you endorse violence. Now again, I think it is fundamental to recognize that we need a resolution of the Middle East conflict but screaming from the river to the sea at children walking into a Jewish day school, that's not an expression of a political opinion, that's hate. And to put a finer point on it, again, you can have strong feelings about what's happening right now in Gaza, but screaming intifada and revolution are the only solution at young people walking into a Hillel for a Shabbat service, again, that is not political, that's hate just like it would be if you stood in front of the Muslim student center and screamed at Muslim students about something you're upset about in Iran or Saudi Arabia or Pakistan. Just like it would be wrong if you stood in front of the Asian Studies Center and screamed at AAPI students because you're upset about what's happening in China or North Korea. So I think we've got to recognize that we need to have our principles and we need to have our opinions but that should not involve 
targeting people because of how they pray or what they may believe or where they're from. It's just wrong. You're, you're absolutely right, and it's, um, there, there are some learnings from your work and your experience, unfortunately, from combating an, uh, hatred in, in every shape and form, way and form. Um, and there's, there's folks who've learned from your experience and are now using those lessons learned to help combat hatred against their communities. I was with Joe Bay co-CEO of KKR a yeah. couple weeks ago, and he was talking about how you personally and the ADL were instrumental in helping him and the Asian American Foundation get started and think about how they change the paradigm for their community. Yeah, so in 2020, we saw with the rise of COVID, uh, the weaponization of hate against Asian American and Pacific Islanders. We saw all over the country. We, so at ADL, we basically do three things, okay? We work to protect our community by, number one, tracking incidents of anti-Semitism offline and online, by uh, monitoring and disrupting the extremists who threaten us, and thirdly, by training law enforcement so they understand how to deal with a hate crime and who are the extremists. It's a big, this is a big part of what we do. We also do advocacy. We litigate. We educate. But we can get to that second. So we work with law enforcement all over the country, and we started getting calls in like January or February of 2020 when Asian Americans were getting harassed, and the police said, we don't know what to do. Like people getting screamed at at the grocery store, or children getting bullied at school. This might not be a crime, Felice, right? But it's a problem. And so I had a conversation with some friends in the Asian American community and said, let me tell you... Um, let me tell you about the history of anti-Semitism, and let me tell you how Israel bashing often leads to acts of hate. And you guys need to think, and that's why we created the ADL in the Jewish community in 1913. Now we're seeing the rise of anti-Asian hate, and what I said to Joe was, this is going to lead, it's gonna go from harassment to violence, to you could have a mass casualty event. Because China bashing and calling it the China virus and the Kung flu and all these other horrible things that, by the way, were coming down the street from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, which was disgusting and inexcusable, inexcusable. I said, you guys need to prepare because this will probably get worse, as it did. And then at his request and that of some other really remarkable people, ADL ended up incubating a new entity called the Asian American Foundation to help train and support the API community, to, to again, measure anti-Asian hate, to monitor the extremists threatening the community, and ultimately to make sure that law enforcement and elected officials support API people. And so to make a long story short, that organization has now raised over a billion dollars for API causes. They're doing incredible work, and whereas they were incubated with us, now it's spun out as a vibrant organization on its own. And look, I feel grateful because if we, look, hate is all interconnected. It really is. And we need to recognize an environment that tolerates prejudice against Asian Americans or American Jews or Muslim Americans or LGBTQ people. Ultimately, all of us will perish in that kind of environment. That's why we think at ADL it's critical to stand up for everyone, regardless of, again, where you're from or who you love or you know, where you pray. So I feel a lot of uh, gratitude for what we were able to do. And I just stand with wonder and look at what TAF is doing now. It's amazing. Thank you. And uh, yeah, t talk to us a little bit about how your work has changed in the last year alone, uh, especially after the October 7th attack of Hamas on, on Israel. So how many of you in the audience right now are Jewish? Raise your hand. Oh, well, pretty most everyone. So what I will tell you, and if you're Jewish, this will likely resonate. Like, if you feel like anti-Semitism is on the rise, you're right. What I mean you're right is not just your felt experience. Let me start by telling you the data. So like I said, ADL tracks anti-Semitic incidents. Oh, since 2016, incidents have gone after staying at a low no We've been tracking incidents for 45 years, since the 1970s. After staying fairly low, 700 to 900 incidents a year, in 2016, something changed. 
And they went up and up and up. And in 2019, 21, and 22, we reached new records of anti-Semitic acts in America. And then in 2023, the number increased an additional 140%. And on 10-7, and really, things exploded on Election Day 2016, and that was emboldenment of what I'll call the far right, the extreme right, who felt emboldened by the rhetoric of that election season. You know what I mean. And then things exploded on 10-7. We saw a 360% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the last 11 weeks of 2022. 360%. And remember, the prior year was the record. So when I talk about incidents, I'm talking about acts of harassment, vandalism, or violence. And ADL tracks this through a network of 25 regional offices. Every incident that gets called in or emailed in or texted in or filled online, we investigate everything we report. So we do not publish reports. We do not publish complaints. We publish verified incidents. And in 2023, the total number was 8,873. That's an almost a 900% increase in the last decade. So in 10 years, the number has gone like that. So anti-Semitic incidents empirically are at the highest point that we've ever seen. And then attitudes. We've been tracking attitudes for 60 years. And attitudes, when we started doing it in 1964, roughly 30% of the US population had intense anti-Semitic attitudes. 30%, it's a lot. Over the subsequent decades, that number dropped, 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 like my and stayed between roughly 8 to 12% for decades. So we do annual or every other year surveys of the general population to assess attitude. When we ran the survey in 2019, thank you, Felice to the rescue. When we ran the survey in 2019, it was 11%. That's what we would expect. Thank you. All right. Oh, I'll give you this. Sorry about that. Musical mics. When we ran in 2019, 11%. By the way, 11% of 330 million Americans is still a lot. When we ran this survey in 22, 20%. We ran it earlier this year, 24%. So whereas incidents are up nearly 900% in the past decade, attitudes have more than doubled in just the past five years. So empirically speaking, something has changed in America and, by the way, around the world. If you go to adl.org slash atlas, you can see our tool for tracking anti-Semitism all over the planet. And, you know, the numbers in Brazil, Argentina, UK, France, Germany, uh, all over the world where Jews live in large concentrations, the anti-Semitic incidents are up 200, 300, 400, 500 percent year over year. So I think it's a perilous time for Jewish people, no matter what your level of observance might be, no matter what your views may be on Israel, like all of us are feeling under threat because we are in ways that are just brand new. Now, and, and the data is absolutely staggering. Uh, and that, that, that is undeniable. How is ADL's work adapting, evolving, changing because of this, what you know, Biden rightfully called a ferocious surge in anti-Semitism. So how is our work changing? So number one, we are certainly spending a lot of time now just responding to incidents. I mean, we have 900 times, 900 percent more than we did 10 years ago. I don't have 900 percent more staff. So that's a bit of a struggle, to be honest, number one. But we are combating that with a combination of innovation and partnerships. So we're using technology to enhance our monitoring of the extremist groups. I mean, last we give thousands of tips every year to law enforcement where we can detect a threat, whether it's from the far right, the radical left, Islamist extremists, Christian nationalists. You know, there's all kinds of extremist groups that we track. That's number one. So we've increased our use of innovation and technology specifically. And now we're looking at how do we implement generative artificial intelligence 
to enhance our response capability. Secondly, um, we're very focused with on the emergence of online hate. Social media is a super spreader of anti-Semitism. So we work with every company from Amazon to Zoom, from Apple to Meta to all the uh, Google products, Reddit. We look at now with intent. Are you on TikTok? Uh, we look at TikTok and we're engaged with them regularly too. TikTok is a catastrophe on the anti-Semitism front. It's, you know, most young people, we often find ourselves calling out media like the New York Times, but kids say they're not on the Times, they're all on TikTok. And if you think the Times is bad, TikTok is, uh, is 10X. Um, we also now monitor video games. The gaming world is a problem. We look at, we have built technology to analyze thousands of hours of podcast content every week. So we're really monitoring all kinds of platforms to think about again, what's already out there and how new innovations like artificial uh, generative intelligence will even make things harder because the rise of synthetic media, deep fakes, um, stuff like that makes, was gonna make it even harder for us. One, one other th way that I think you all have really a, um, been a resource is to help employers and employees help combat anti-Semitism in the workplace. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that work. Talk to us kind of what's, what have you seen or the kind of general trends and what are the lessons learned that we can apply here at the World Bank? We've got 18,000 employees, offices literally all around the world. What, what can we be doing better here? So I appreciate Felice bringing this up because I think whereas we're spending a lot of time now on our college campuses, I'm deeply concerned about workplaces. So how many of you have experienced what you might think of as like a microaggression here at work? Raise your hand, a few of you. So, and how many of you have done like a DEI training here at the bank? Raise your hand. And how many of you have had anti-Semitism in that training? Okay. So I just wanna note the uh, Venn diagram. There's no overlap at all. And this is, it's not unique to the bank, Felice. So we've seen in the, some of the largest companies and the most prestigious universities, they're all doing DEI training. Rarely does it include anything on anti-Semitism. So we have adapted not only to press upon corporations and, and um, universities and other workplaces to update their diversity training. Because let me tell you something, I deeply believe in diversity training. I think we are better managers and we're better colleagues if we understand one another and our backgrounds. Like diversity training in our multicultural, pluralistic society is a good thing. But there is something wrong if your diversity, equity, and inclusion excludes Jews. And if it doesn't even contemplate the most targeted religious minority in the country. If that's your idea of DEI, you're doing it wrong. So what are we doing? We're developing content to help those, those entities with DEI programs to update it to include anti-Semitism. That's fundamental. And I really think we even need, need to step back and think about what's the DEI point of the DEI training in the first place. I think we need less rote diversity and more true pluralism. I think we need less of a focus on equity and more of a focus on equality and opportunity. And ultimately, it's about empathy and walking in each other's shoes and make sure everyone has an equal chance, irrespective of, again, their race or their religion, their sexual orientation or anything else. So we are really trying to adapt to support diversity training and diversity education in a way that really makes sure everyone feels a sense of belonging, including Jewish people. And it's, it's an incredible resource and, and one where we're, we're, we're gleaning and learning from here at the bank. Um, but to your point, there's always more that we can be doing. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, in fairness to you at the bank, like we're all just learning this. Yeah. We're all realizing this. I mean, ADL has been doing anti-hate content in schools for decades. We're one of the largest providers in the United States of anti-hate content in K-12 schools. We reach four and a half million kids a year. So we're trying to take those methodologies and adapt them now to workplaces. Going back to something you said before, you were talking about partnerships. Have you seen an increase in inbound interest and allyship for partnerships? And, and also just in follow-up to that, what can non-Jewish people do to help combat 
anti-Semitism and hate. So I want all of you to realize how awesome Felice is. No, I say that because we don't get asked that question nearly enough. And I know if you're out there and you're listening to me and you're Jewish, you know what I'm talking about. We don't often have people who are non-Jewish say, hey, how can I help? We just don't. So the reality is, is as a Jewish community and as an organization, ADL is deeply committed to allyship. One of my proudest moments at ADL, or some of my proudest moments, have been launching the Asian American Foundation um, or standing up and visiting the border and standing up for um, Latinos and immigrants who are coming across the border, the terrible thing that happened in the Trump administration where they were separating the children from their parents. Um, and I also think about last summer, ADL co-chaired the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. And I, had the, I was gifted with the privilege of speaking in front of the Lincoln Memorial as my predecessors had done 60 years earlier with the head of the NAACP and Al Sharpton from the National Action Network and Martin Luther King III. These were incre it's an incredible privilege to do that work. But to answer Felice's question, I'm not getting as many inbound calls as I might like. And what's telling is that allyship, in my, in my definition, is not what you do when it's easy. Allyship is, what you, is how you show up when it's hard. Allyship is when someone invites you to speak at an event, gets political pressure to drop you and says, I'm not going to drop you. I want you to come. That's allyship. Allyship is what happens when protesters say, you know, we want to drop an organization and the group says, no way, we're sticking with, in this case, ADL. That's allyship. But in fairness to our prospective allies, if we want them to check in with us, we need to check in with them. If you're wondering why your phone isn't ringing, make sure you're also picking up the phone. I know it might be nice if someone called you out of the blue and said, come speak to my group like Felice did for me. But sometimes we need to remind our friends that, hey, we might need a little bit of help. So we have to be willing to be vulnerable and ask for help if we want it to come our way. Sometimes that's hard to do because we have pride or ego. But I, I really believe it's critical. I really believe it's important so that our friends know we need help. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's crazy. We're, we're literally running up against time, but I want to end on uh, two questions. One is, what is keeping you up at night? And we've been talking a lot about really heavy things, um, a lot of hate and harm and violence. What gives you hope and gets you going in the morning? So what keeps me up at night? It's getting woken up at three in the morning on a Friday night to Saturday morning when the head of my, my office in Israel calls from her, the bomb shelter in her home to tell me that there are hundreds of missiles coming into Israel and she doesn't know what to do. What keeps me up at night is uh, the worry that I'm gonna get a phone call about a synagogue in Europe or about a Jewish community center here in America where there was a shooting or a bombing. And it's not lost on me what Ambassador Lipstadt said. I'll be there too in July for the 30th anniversary of the bombing of the AMIA Center in Buenos Aires where hundreds of people were killed, children, babies, by a Hezbollah bomber. So what keeps me up at night in this job at ADL is literally the fear of some terrible act of hate directed against the Jewish community. That keeps me up at night. On the other hand, what gives me hope? Number one, the United States of America gives me a lot of hope because as bad as it's been, and it's been a tough few years, let's, let's not lie. We had people ransacking the Capitol just a few years ago. And I think our communities in some ways feel more polarized than ever. But what gives me hope is this country has been through civil war, 
social unrest, economic upheaval, global conflict, and yet we always come out stronger on the other side. So I am long on democracy, and I am long on America. So that, number one, gives me hope. Second thing that gives me hope is, I gotta tell you something, Felice, the Jewish people are the most resilient people in the world. And Man. we don't quit. To the chagrin of the Romans, to the Hamasniks and everyone in between, but Jews don't quit. We don't quit. And so I think about my grandfather's story and my wife's story. And now I think about the story that I'm writing every single day. And I am, I'm not going to quit, not for a second. And then I think the other thing that gives me hope are my children. Usually they just give me grief, <laughs> right? I had a whole head of hair before my ch three <laughs> children were born. But um, no, actually, they keep me honest every day. And they give me a ton of hope. And for that, I have a lot of gratitude. Amen. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your example of resilience and perseverance. You're an inspiration to many of us. Um, and I'm very honored to call you a friend. Thank the, you. For the honor is mine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. We've got some uh, refreshments in the back. Uh, and uh, hopefully this is, my understanding is it's the first, but I guarantee you it won't be the last Jewish American event. Thank you.